Okay, so let me get started. Oh, good. This is uh, one of the questions I've done before, so good. Um, it says, uh, Daredevil cyclist of some mass, including the cycle and the cyclist, attempt to loop the loop maneuver through K. Okay. What is the minimum speed they must have at the top of the loop in order not to lose contact with the track? Ah. So this is the picture that you are considering. Um, so let me draw the loop so that I have something to think about. And you have, the, I'm just going to represent the cyclist as a mass um, of mass M. Um, and it's talking about in order to not lose uh, contact with the track. And I hope as you consider this mess um, at the top of the track, if it's simply at rest here, it's going to fall down, just straight down. And that's not really completing a loop-the-loop -loop maneuver. So the real picture for this, um, um, for this mess at the top of the track must be where it's moving at some speed of V. Let me call that V final. And as this mass is moving at some speed, let me draw the free body diagram so that I have some sense of how, um, what kind of forces are on this uh, cycle and the cyclist. So on this free body diagram, I'm going to have gravity. I, there's always gravity. And if you're thinking through any other force, or in other words, any other thing that's touching the cycle and the cyclist, the only thing else that's touching them is the track. And uh, the, any surface of contact can exert two forces, normal force or friction. Here, let's make things easy. Make, let's say it's frictionless. So there must be normal force. And the only direction that normal force can point in is perpendicular away from the surface. So this is the possible, the only possible direction of the normal force. And, and what this picture is showing is that the cyclist, as he undergoes this motion, there's an overall downward acceleration. There's no other force that would balance it out or have it so that um, something different happens. And what you, the realization you need to come to as you're answering this question is that because this is a circular motion, that this downward acceleration, which is actually in the direction of the center of a circle, that's completely expected. That is what you should have. And um, in fact, you have an expression for this downward acceleration, that it's equal to the tangential speed squared divided by r, v squared over r. So, so this is a complete free body diagram. Um, you have uh, two forces pushing it downward, those will result in a net force, which uh, does give you the, uh, the necessary centripetal acceleration. So after having worked through this, um, there's a meaning to what they mean by the minimum speed. Uh, it goes to when I wrote down the normal force. Uh, we are not given the value of the normal force. The normal force is basically whatever it needs to be so that you get the correct acceleration gave us some tangential speed. So if you are looking for minimum speed, we are looking for minimum acceleration, which means we are looking for minimum sum of forces, uh, which must mean, uh, in order for this sum to be minimum, this normal force is going to go to the minimum possible, zero. So, in, so for the, um, this uh, minimum uh, possible speed or minimum speed they need to have at the top will say the cycle is about to barely lose contact with the track. So normal force is just barely going to zero. So our net force here in the centripetal direction will be just the gravity mg. So we are saying this is equal to my mass times acceleration. We have expression for the acceleration there. So uh, the equation we are working with is my minimum speed 
squared over uh, r acceleration is equal to the net force divided by mass. Oh, I think I have all the expression here. So um, just move the r over, take the square root, then what you get is v final minimum is square root of r times g. Yeah, that's it. Uh, pretty simple. So let's say if we uh, final mean is equal to square root of r times g. And I'll um, attach this as work later. So b says, assuming that the cyclist simply rolls through the loop, right? So energy is conserved, no additional push from the cycle. How fast should they be moving at the bottom of the loop in order to complete the loop? The loop? Ah, okay. So let me just copy this over so that I have a picture for B. So we are considering two different snapshots. Uh, when I, whenever I deal with um, kind of the scenario that I'm going to describe, I like to think in terms of snapshots. So um, the scenario we have is a scenario where energy is conserved. Uh, that's uh, really the point of them telling us there's no additional push from the cycle. There is an, an additional input of energy into the system. So there's some um, in, initial speed at the bottom of the loop, and this uh, cycle and the cyclist uh, is going to undergo this kind of motion and eventually reach this position and reach this speed. And no energy input. And I think it's simple enough for us to assume that frictional forces are negligible, so uh, total energy will be conserved. Then the snapshots that um, we are thinking of, it's uh, guided by really two things. One, uh, between the two snapshots, the conserved quantity must be conserved. Otherwise, you can't use conservation law. And the second thing is the snapshot you choose must be somehow useful. I think the argument for why the top snapshot is useful is um, it's the setup where we know the most of the quantities. We just figured out what this speed must be. Oh, and we also know the what the height is. If we say uh, this is my y is equal to zero, then the, the height at this uh, position at the top is 2r twice the radius. So I know the most information about the cyclist here. That's why this snapshot is useful. Let me call that top. And the usefulness, and but, uh, but this top snapshot alone won't answer the question that we are interested in, which is that how fast should they be moving at the bottom of the loop? So that's where the bottom snapshot comes in. You really need this snapshot in order to relate your expressions to this unknown quantity that the question is actually asking you about. So you choose those two snapshots based on those criteria, you know, can you apply the conservation law that you maybe are identifying? And two, uh, is the, are they useful? Or do they relate my unknowns to knowns? So once you've chosen those snapshots, so this is my bottom snapshot, then you just uh, write out your conservation law equation. I say, okay, my total energy at the top is equal to my total energy at the bottom. Oh, I kind of got the initial and the final flipped, but you know, it's equality, the direction doesn't matter. So I'm just gonna leave them be. My total energy at the top, there's gonna be potential energy component plus the kinetic energy component uh, which will be um, uh, the gravitational potential energy, mg times the height, 2r, plus, and here there's kinetic energy. That was really the point of part A, where we are figuring out what minimum speed does it need. It's going to be one half m times v final mean squared. And the total energy at the bottom, it's got the same component. Uh, there should be a potential energy at the bottom although that's just going to be zero because we are setting y equals zero at the bottom, plus the kinetic energy at the bottom, which will relate to this unknown quantity here. So zero plus one half m v naught squared. The left-hand side quantity is conserved, so it should equal the right-hand side quantity. Let's cancel out some of the simple things that cancel out so that my expression is simple. 
that's cancels out because it occurs in every term. Um, I think that might be it. Um, I think I can do this algebra in my head. V naught squared is equal to multiply through by two. So two times g r g times two r. So four g r plus v final mean uh, squared. So to get the um, the v naught itself, you need to take the square root of both sides. So that gets you that. Um, yeah, let me write it down. And uh, you could technically um, go a little further, but let me just uh, put it into the answer. 4 times g times r plus uh, v final mean squared, uh, where uh, v final means squared is uh, what we calculated in A. And, um, and I will say most of the times this is perfectly fine. Uh, you can give your answer in terms of a new quantity that you've defined elsewhere. Um, I guess uh, what you can't do is you can say, oh, if we find all means in attached work. Because, uh, <laughs> um, it, it, you know, use your judgment. So I grade your answers uh, in light of the work you attach. And if everything has been put off into the attached work, then there isn't anything for me to create. Um, so here, both of these are actually in the answer. So I, I think it's fine. So in the, in the work, I might even put in, OK, what was my V final mean squared uh, RG? Oh, so I can actually write this a lot simpler. It's a 4 RG plus RG. So it's a 5 uh, R times G. So it is actually a lot simpler to simply put that in. Um, all right. Uh, Percy, how much time do I have? Five minutes? Uh, oh, eight minutes. All right. Uh, I think that's enough time. So upon realizing that the cycle will be a, a bicycle, not a motorcycle, the cyclist decides to roll down the hill. All right. Uh, let me set this up. Um, yeah. So we have this uh, modified setup. And with this modified setup, um, gaining enough speed from the downhill to roll to make it through the loop without losing contact with the track. What minimum height h should they roll down from? Interesting question. OK. So the one important snapshot is still this. Gaining enough speed from the downhill roll to make it through the loop without losing contact with the track. That part of the question text gives, tells me that the cyclist at the top moving at the minimum speed that we calculated in A above. That is still there. So let me just mark this as one of the snapshots that we'll use. And the other important question to settle is what other snapshots to use? I think a lot of people have temptation to use the snapshot down here because we've calculated speed of wind not above. So you want to use this snapshot because you feel like you know a lot about that. Um, and what I will tell you is that, I mean, you can do that. It's not wrong, but it's kind of a waste of a time because what we are looking for is not information about how fast they are going here. What we are looking for is the initial height that they must roll down from. And if you can convince yourself that total energy is conserved from the beginning, rolling down, moving at some speed here, and then doing loop the loop up to this point, if you can convince yourself that the total energy is con conserved throughout the entire motion here, then there's no need to break it up. You can just go straight from the beginning, call this initial, to the final. There, because really what's important here is that your conserved quantity is conserved. And if you are convinced that your conserved quantity you are working with is conserved from beginning to the end, then you can just go from beginning to the end. There's no need to break it up. So. With that, I can write down, OK, my total initial energy is equal to my total final energy. 
uh, let me just set some parameters. So my uh, let me not just let me just uh, put the same uh, reference point so that I don't confuse myself. This is my y is equal to zero. So at this position, the height is two r, uh, same as before. So my total final energy it will have the same expression as before. My potential energy is mg times two r, and my kinetic energy is still one half m times v final mean squared and my total initial energy is uh, rolling down from rest i think he says roll down it doesn't say from rest but it's a reasonable assumption i'll assume he's rolling down from rest so he has initial gravitational potential energy and no kinetic energy um, Okay, so I have uh, one equation, and I think my only unknown is h. Yeah, this I can just plug in the va in expression from a. So I'll say, okay, uh, my masses cancel out, and let's solve for h. A uh, pretty simple algebra. My h is equal to uh, divided by g. Oh, g's are uh, might cancel out. So h is equal to two r over g, or two r times g over g. So two r plus uh, one half v final mean squared over g. So if you want, you could leave your answer this way. h is equal to two times r plus uh, one half times uh, v final mean squared over g, um, where v final mean is uh, what we calculated in a. Now, as you, you've seen before, if I plug in the actual expression for V final mean, I think I have it memorized now, <laughs> square of that is R times G. So when you plug that in, it actually gets a lot simpler. H becomes uh, 2R plus RG, that's the squared quantity, divided by 2G, G is cancelled, so 2 plus 1 half, that, uh, let me write it down as 2.5. Oh, this is a much simpler expression. Doesn't have any spurious dependence on G. So let me um, just put in uh, oh, the H is equal to 2.5 times R. Uh, good. So I think that's uh, um, all the parts. Yeah, and uh, with the conservation of energy momentum, if you are finding that um, the math is a lot simpler, then that's great. That's kind of the way. That's the whole point of introducing conservation of energy and momentum. It really simplifies some of the analytical steps because uh, really the conservation law is a lot simpler than uh, than than kinematics than even standard strategy that we are using before. So I think I have enough time to actually paste this in while I'm still in the attempt. So, but uh, as a reminder, you can always attach your work after uh, your time runs out. So don't worry about attaching it while you are still within the attempt. Uh, if anything, do be careful about not um, you know, spending so much time typing things in here where sometimes if you get kicked out, uh, it might um, as you in the process of getting kicked out, sometimes things get lost. Um, so make sure that uh, you don't lose your work in the process of getting kicked out or anything like that. All right. So and uh, you probably want to do more, um, put in more time organizing than I'm apparently doing. So all right. Let me submit it then. Yeah. Um, save work and continue and so you know if you want to reattach uh, attach or uh, change your work then you should simply refresh on this screen because that'll bring back this button that you can use to actually change your work um, and uh, uh, you can review your work uh, in the view only mode both your answers and your attached work now um, I guess uh, until midnight tonight, uh, you won't see the answer key. But after midnight tonight, you should see the answer keys pop up. I finished the programming in all the uh, answer keys. So uh, 
you sh you can look at the model answer and see how well you did. Um, uh, kind of give your sense of uh, give yourself uh, some sense of um, uh, where you are, um, uh, especially because as you are. Um, our activity in the lab uh, this week is that group review of the timed assessment. Um, it, it, I think our first one went so you know, it's this one, April sixth. I think our first one, uh, first one went well enough. So we are continuing. Uh, for those of you who are completing these timed assessments, I will pre create a printout of it so that you can look at that. Um, and for those of you who are still getting caught up and have an earlier timed assessment done, I can print those out. Or you know, if you want a different one printed, just let me know. I can just uh, either print it at the session or I can print it ahead of it. Just let me know. 